is a real emitter and a, uh, is horrible. Right? And you're absolutely right. Hypocrisy, you know, lack of solidarity in this world. Not just, that's not just in the West. It's also look at the Muslim world as well. So, so I think you know we are in such a terrible situation right now. But you know we cannot be pessimists because you know in every crisis there's an opportunity to do better. Right? We all have to come together, work together and find the solutions together. So I think it's there. We have enough intelligence, equipment, tools, everything to solve the problems of the world today. We have everything we need. It's now a matter of political will. It's a matter of community pressure coming from uh, everyone. You know, uh, and I think people power is the most powerful thing in the world. We're going to do one last round of uh, questions. Please. Satu per empat daripada bayuni yang ada di Malaysia Macam mana kita nak solve problem? Can we get the other question? Yeah. Okay, kita check in Kat hotel Okay, kita check in sekarang. So ini Haiti dengan KJ dan Tasim. So ini lah pesawat punya acara. In Taiwan, and I was I was happy to share the stage. And of course, uh, it happens to be a women's organization. It's not it's probably the only women's organization in Malaysia that actually has a consultative status at ECOSOC, at the United Nations. So the United Nations Economic and Social Council, um, say was there as uh, one of the key stakeholders. So today, uh, we're going to start with a chat. I'm going to chat with uh, somebody I respect very much. Um, old family friend, turn colleague, turn mentor. Um, about something very important, and I think in the spirit of wanting to get everyone involved, we've got microphones, I think, later, and we're going to open up to the floor so that you can ask uh, questions. Uh, I really need to talk to Jamila about the planet and not to me about politics. Um, but uh, I wanted to start by setting the scene, and we brought some nice photos later at the side of, uh, uh, of the screens uh, about what we're going to talk about. But um, I wanted to start by sharing my impression and my story about how I view our guest of honor, Tansi uh, Dr. Jamila. So some of you will know Tansi Dr. Jamila as your doctor. Uh, Aisha, my, my niece here, was delivered by Dr. Jamila and her wonderful husband, Dr. Dr. Aisha, and her husband. Um, so that's her background as a physician, but also as a obstetrician and gynecologist. Um, and of course, Dr. Asha and Dr. Jamila were rock star ops guy in, in, in Malaysia uh, for many, many years. Of course, 
the hospital wasn't enough for her. You know, she, she was, uh, I, I told her in the waiting room just now, I said, Doc, you have been interested in life and humanity. So that took you from the delivery room, where you literally delivered life uh, out into the field, into, human, into communities, and into humanitarian work, because that's also equally important. Life starts mainly nowadays in the delivery room of hospitals, but it has to be sustained everywhere. And we are privileged, because we live in a country which is peaceful, relatively prosperous, we do quite well, but she was advisor to the Prime Minister of Public Health. And what lessons can we learn from COVID going forward? Yeah, thank you very much. I think there were many things that were problematic. First of all, you know, this is a, a, a pandemic of a magnitude the world had not seen. So there are many firsts, and therefore there are many things that we don't know and expect to happen. So you have to almost be creative on the ball, on the road, right? and keep your eyes on the, on the bigger outcome. The first thing I would say is that um, it has to be everyone involved in the management of COVID. So our communication to people, especially lay people, has to be very, very clear. Because if people don't collaborate and cooperate, then it's very hard to put a pandemic uh, under control. The second thing I would learn, uh, the, the best lesson we learn is early vaccination. And I think you know, many people don't know the details of the vaccination program, but it was such an honor for me to work alongside you um, because I think your dynamic leadership, your willingness to listen, to try new things, uh, was instrumental in us getting the pandemic under control. In fact, it's historical that we're back here because this is where we started our first PPB. Yes. You remember, you had to register patients yeah, yeah, and yeah. I had to vaccinate patients. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, there were still vaccines left and everyone told me, we cannot waste any vaccines. So I had to run out and pull anyone who's around yeah. me to say, come and vaccinate, um, you know, including the sleepers and the restaurant uh, operators and so forth. So that early vaccination was really important. The third, I think, is you know how do you rebuild trust we, we were in a very difficult situation because politically it was a, a very unique situation at the time and in that case, you know, there's a lot of mistrust. So, and the fourth I would say is how do we be better prepared for the next one? Have we learned enough? Uh, have we been able to put the lessons to good use? And if the pandemic happens again, are we ready to you know, rapidly scale up in our interventions. So getting everyone involved is very important, not just the Ministry of Health. Getting the message out clearly, getting vaccinations early, and being prepared for the next. Life to be sustainable. If once you tip like 1.5, you will rapidly go to 2, 2.5, 3, and life on Earth cannot be sustained at these temperatures. We are already close to 1.5, um, and therefore, you know, we need to not just focus on mitigation or prevention. We now need to also adapt our lives to be able to deal with this 1.5. Yeah. So, when you get to a situation where we are in the Anthropocene, the uh, Earth. Uh, that God created for us. It cannot absorb, and it doesn't have that self-healing mechanism because we've gone beyond that limit. Yeah. And I used to only think that it was about climate change. So back this alluding now, 1.5, we have to make sure that we reduce our carbon emissions so that we can get down to below 1.5 and not get to two degrees Celsius warming above uh, industrial age temperatures. But it's actually more than that, right, Tansi? Because you've, um, you asked me to go and do some uh, research, and I've done so. It's not just about waiting. What is the safe space? So a group of scientists actually came together, led by Johan Rockström, who is in the documentary that uh, Kyrie mentioned, and said, here are the nine things we can measure to be able to tell us whether we are in a safe space or not. And the 19, nine, of the nine things, only one is climate change. It's also got to do with our land use, it's got to do with fresh water, 
uh, uh, fresh water. It's also got to do with ocean acidification. It's also got to do with nitrogen and phosphorus levels. A lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus are put into the soil as fertilizers. It's also got to do with novel entities, which are chemicals that are released into the air, and also you know other entities. So I think ozone layer is one of them as well. So nine things you can measure. That's that's the diagram. So it's, it's there. You can see the yeah. nine things that are measured. So it's not just uh, climate change, as yeah. you mentioned. Uh, you've got uh, biodiversity loss. Yeah. So that's loss of uh, fauna and flora. I think uh, a lot of extinct. Uh, so in, in the context of Malaysia, for instance, uh, the, Malay, the Malayan tiger. Uh, risk, yeah. uh, so all these things are either endangered or, or extinct. Um, you're talking about ozone depletion. You're talking about uh, uh, atmospheric aerosol loading, yeah. chemical pollution, ocean acidification. All these things are related. I think what Tashi is saying is that these are different systems that sustain the planet. So it's not just the global warming. All, if all these things are out of whack, then we are out of whack. So you were telling me earlier about you know, the deodorant use. Yeah. So you see ozone layer and aerosol is still safe. And, and I think it's very important in this diagram to say that when the first description of the planetary boundaries came out in 2009, only three boundaries were crossed. This is from late last year. We've already crossed six boundaries. So it's actually very, very alarming uh, that you know we are rapidly destroying a lot of the what we call the Earth system uh, resilience. Right? So the chapter yang tadi nak sampaikan tadi, who who here is born uh, before 1970 or the 1970s and before? So you're not uncomfortable? I will raise my hand. Also. <laughs> so quite a lot of you uh, born 1970 and before 19. Do you remember in, in the mid 1980s? In the mid 1980s, we were told, and in those days there was no social media. We were told on TV, in schools, and in newspapers that there was a hole in the sky. Do you remember? We all remember this. There was a hole in the sky. I remember somebody coming to my school uh, in 1986 or something like that because they discovered in 85 that there was a hole in a layer called the ozone layer. We all remember this, right? It's crazy. And we know what the ozone layer is. It's a layer that protects us from UV, in particular UVB light from the sunlight. And there was a hole there, because, especially because we were releasing certain uh, chemicals uh, into the uh, atmosphere. And one of the big culprits was something called CFC. You all remember this, right? CFC, chlorofluorocarbon. And for us, normal people, the thing that we used, which was CFC, was the odor and not. So we had this dilemma of how do we look after our body odor? Because suddenly we cannot use CFC anymore and we have to move to roll on. And we all did this, and as Tanchi said, of all the boundaries that we have crossed, ozone depletion is the only one that's reversed. It's the only one that's reversed because we decided not to use spray deodorant anymore. <laughs>
it's about things that we can see. You know, uh, that's why we call it pencemaran. You can see it, pencemaran uh, alam kita, pencemaran, pencemaran udara. You can see the black smoke and things like that. But in fact, there is emerging pollution that is difficult for us to detect. And one of the biggest uh, high-risk areas, which uh, falls into global boundaries because you're talking about the oceans, is uh, microplastics, especially microplastics in water supply. Um, can you tell us a little bit about microplastics? Because I'm told Malaysia is not doing well at all. So Malaysia at the moment is the highest per, per person uh, in ingester or consumer of microplastics, all of us. Right. And it's in baby species. It's in baby species, it crosses placental tissue, it's in breast milk, it's also in male testicular tissue. That's how deep it's gone. Now, microplastics happen because we are using so many of the single-use plastics, they get to the ocean, uh, they're ingested by fish, uh, they're also evaporating now. You know, in one liter of water, you will have up to 250,000 nanoparticles of microplastic. It's in the air, it's in the clouds, so we're also breathing in microplastics. Now, microplastics causes something called neuroendocrine disorders, and that includes a range of things, from cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, you name it. So, you know... Alzheimer's? Yes, uh, neurological disorders, and I think that... I always joke that when I die, you can make a credit card out of me, right? Because um, <laughs> there's enough plastic in me, probably, to use one. But, but um, you know, but, but it's not a joke. It's really, you know, it's quite serious. And the, the problem is how do you treat microplastics? You can't. So what we need to do now is prevent. So you will see, and I'm glad that you did the same today, um, I never drink from a plastic water bottle. So I think the first thing you do is when you're organizing things to say to the organizer, you do not want any plastic, you do not want any single-use single plastic, uh, so that, you know, we drive a message, all of us have played this role, right? And then the other thing, if I may, Kyrie, is that food waste, right? This is really alarming. 40% of food waste, which, uh, which means that the 40% of the food you buy and put in the fridge or whatever it is, is thrown away. This is national data and global data. No, because I know this, because you know, I mean, my, my whole party, I know, bila kita ada mesyuarat cawangan, yang datang semua wanita ada. Datang semua wanita. Laki semua isap wokok kat luar. Okay, anyway. So a lot of the solutions are community-based. And I wanted to talk about this because we have a lot of big national documents, uh, National Energy Transition Roadmap, Net Zero 2050. So by 2050, Malaysia, not Malaysia, but our aspiration is that we are net zero. Our carbon emission is offset by uh, mitigation and adaptation measures so that we are net zero by 2050. But let's face it, Tan a lot of these things need to happen on the ground in communities. If they check out at the national level, but at the end of the day, if the communities are not doing it at the kampong level, at the uh, housing estate level, then it's not going to work. Absolutely, and I think change happens when communities mobilize, right? Um, I think you know women have such an important role, not just in terms of what they can do, but also what they can influence. So the influence obviously will be on their children. You know, women will talk to their children, educate their children, but also talk to their husbands. You know, I remember in one talk that I gave, I, I talked about conflict and working in Afghanistan, and I worked during the time of Taliban. And I said, you know, I was so fortunate being a woman because I could go into the homes of, of these uh, people. And whether you're Taliban or not, when your wife speaks to you, you listen. So, you know. <laughs> so, so, so I think that, you know, women have a real uh, distinct role. And, uh, and I think it starts from home. Right? If we, if, you know, through organizations like Paseva, to go down to communities, educate them on how harmful it is some of the yeah, things they're doing, how they move towards a much more sustainable lifestyle. Because the challenge though, people will say, ah, sustainability into to Not really. It's about going back to basics, going back to, for example, what diet you give your children to eat. 
If you can cut down your meat intake, because agriculture, particularly livestock agriculture, is one of the biggest causes of de degradation of forests. And you know, if we can say start with meatless Monday, <coughs> meatless Fridays. <coughs> <laughs> so, so, so I think, but it's important because you know there will, there's just not enough water left you know, in future to sustain these farms, these large farms, right? If you have you know grazing animals, that's why I want to what I am Campo, you know, campaign uh, and you don't breed in large, large, you know, lot, feed lots, right? So it's, it's it's much healthier than those that you give, and you know the things that they give them to eat. You have to remember that when you want to mass produce meat, it's pumped with antibiotics. It causes another problem of antimicrobial resistance in the future, which is estimated to kill about 10 million people by 2050. So there's a lot of harm uh, in the choices that we make, even with food. Tazi, I want to bring the discussion to where how Malaysia is doing. Mm. Because we speak about the, the global boundaries in climate change, in evolution, in bio, yeah. biodiversity, and things like that. Are we are we doing okay, Malaysia? Because we are we are we, I mean we should be blessed, right? God has blessed this country as a carbon sink, supposedly. The carbon sink meaning that we have tropical jungle and that takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So we are one of the biggest carbon sinks in the world. Uh, so surely we are we are not a problem, right? We're, we're doing well, right? So let's go back to science and evidence, right? So this diagram so that you see on the slides comes from something called the University of Leeds Good Life Index. What they have measured is they look at the inner circle, and this is to do with donor economics. The inner circle is what you call social foundations, basically our sustainable development goals. The outer circle in green is your ecological city, the planetary boundaries that I mentioned earlier. Now this research showed that I just put three countries to compare, Malaysia, United States, and Vietnam. Mera tak best. Mera is not good. So Malaysia has actually crossed about seven boundaries. So it's not really good. And yet on the social front, we haven't really, we're not really brilliant. And it's there, better than many countries. But you, so we're almost like US, you know, in the state, in sense of, you know, our pollution uh, per capita, right? But if you look at on the left, extreme left, Vietnam, which is an emerging economy, you will see that, okay, on the social side, maybe they also have some gaps, not much more than Malaysia, but they're doing quite well on their planetary boundaries. So what we need to do now, and I, you know, I, when I engage with the Vietnamese government, I tell them, what is their number one worry? They tell me it's climate change. And I told them, no, it's beyond climate change. You need to look at this. So, you know, in developing their economies in the future, they need to think about how it's going to impact. So I always say that why can't we have this aspiration? China is the uh, supply chain leader in the world. ASEAN is the sustainable supply chain leader of the world. So that mindset shift needs to happen. Therefore, economic development has to take a different role because the EU, the US, and others will put on very strict measures and sanctions for unsustainable uh, goods. So it's better for us to be... So the data is showing that in terms of the uh, environmental ceilings and the uh, planetary boundaries, Vietnam is doing better than us. Yes. Are you sure? The communist country didn't the data that runs better than No, I'm joking. So that's, that's, uh, that's something of concern. Which brings me to uh, the, the broader point, actually. Because I think you, you just ended your last intervention by saying that we have to start thinking about new aspirations. But at the same time, most importantly, your citizens are happy. And yeah. yeah. And then I, I, the, we just recorded an episode of our podcast yesterday, and uh, Cheryl and I were reflecting on Rebecca. And, uh, you know, happiness is ingrained in the DNA of our country because the standout line of our national anthem is that God has graced us with happiness. Rahmat bahagia Tuhan kurniakan. I mean, I don't know why uh, the, the, the author of the national anthem, and of course, about Rahman who approved it, chose that. He was the happiest prime minister, but he, he never did that. It was, the, the, the line before, of course, speaks about progress, it speaks about unity, 
but what God has graced us with yes. is happiness. Yes. So um, it's, it's definitely engraved in us so that we aspire towards something a bit more yeah. than just uh, material development. But coming back to this donut, donut economics, uh, Tashi, I want you to share with everyone, you've been doing some work with Ipoh, apparently. Yeah. So Ipoh has uh, embraced this new form of development. So Ipoh here, that is not just GDP, just the, 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 the money, so to speak, but something a bit more sustainable, something a bit more regenerative. Can you explain and share with us what you've been doing uh, in Ipoh? So um, we managed to work with the Ipoh municipality to say, can we pilot a donor economic model in Ipoh? Donor economy is basically around these two boundaries that I mentioned, the social foundations and the ecological ceiling. So how do you regenerate economy in Ipoh, make it a city that people want to live in, people are happy, uh, that uh, it's not going to damage the planet as well. So uh, I'll give you some examples. We have looked at, with the municipality, five disused uh, mines and regenerated the forests around the mines and they become new ecotourism sites and really built the new economy based on ecotourism from what was abandoned land. So this is why it's called regenerative. It's not just a figure, but you regenerate uh, nature and you re regenerate the planet as well. Um, for example, the UTC in Ipoh is completely solarized uh, in terms of energy. The market in Ipoh, which is quite big and famous, is uh, harvesting rainwater to make sure that they clean the market using rainwater. So really, when you look at natural systems, so it lowers the cost to the government, but also uh, brings a lot of benefit to the planet. So these are just some examples. We're going to expand further, looking at how communities can become stronger and more resilient and prepare for disasters. How do we also look at um, community happiness and cohesion? So this is very important as part of the whole of the global economic model. And I'm very pleased to share that Ipoh is the first city in Asia that has embraced this. And I chose Ipoh as a pilot because it is the same size and same population as Amsterdam, which was the first Ipoh, uh, sorry, which was the first donut city city to embrace donor economics. And Ipoh just was, has been awarded now uh, the UN Habitat School of Honor, uh, which the mayor will go and pick up in November. Fantastic. I'm going to open up to the floor in, in just a second. Uh, so while you get ready and while the uh, team gets ready uh, with the microphones uh, for, for everyone to come in. Uh, but before we open up, I just wanted to just extend that a little bit. Uh, to also share about what other countries are doing and reimagining their, their future. So maybe for Malaysia, we keep the tak rasa sangat. It's about this, uh, this, these changes that are happening. It's existential in a sense that it, it will affect us, maybe not us, but our children and our grandchildren, uh, but not in the clear, uh, in, the, in the immediate term. Yes, we have droughts. Yes, we have famine. Yes, we have floods but it's not existential in the sense that it will make us extinct yeah. or our country extinct. But for some countries, um, and some countries, Governor, who are part of your Persewa network, your Pan-Pacific network, this is a, this is an existential problem. Tanshi was telling me that countries in, uh, in the Pacific, Kiribati and all these other countries, they are starting to think about how to define a country without an island. Because that's why they don't have an island. So can they have an IC? but be somewhere else and still be the people of Kiribati. That, that's happening, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, first of all, many of the Pacific Islands will be underwater uh, by 2100. And so I think the war is a real emitter and uh, it's horrible. I, and you're absolutely right, hypocrisy, you know, lack of solidarity in this world, not just, that's not just in the West, it's also look at the Muslim world as well. So, so I think you know we are in such a terrible situation right now. But you know we cannot be pessimists because you know in every crisis there's an opportunity to do better. Right? We all have to come together, work together, and find the solutions together. So I think it's there. We have enough intelligence, equipment, tools, everything to solve the problems of the world today. We have everything we need. It's now a matter of political will. It's a matter of community pressure coming from uh, everyone. You know, uh, and I think people power is the most powerful thing in the world. We're going to do one last round of uh, questions. Please.